Sometimes in life you end up somewhere so beautiful, you can't help but stop and wonder, what did I do to get so damn lucky? And you may find yourself in another part of the world. And you may find yourself behind the wheel of a small automobile. And you may find yourself with a beautiful view, living a beautiful life. And you may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? Pinch me. No, I mean it. Go ahead, pinch me. I'm here in Hawaii with five generations of Porsche Roadsters. And I've got the keys to each and every one of these things. This is a dream drive. I'm about to go hop in the 356 Speedster, which I've never driven before. Some days you just feel tremendously lucky and today is absolutely one of those days. This is the icon, the 1955 Porsche Speedster. Now, I gotta be candid with you. Me, I tend to like quirky and weird stuff. So the 914.6 that's also part of this program was the car that I thought I was gonna bond with the most. But the truth is, it's this cherry red 356. This is one of the very best classic cars I've ever driven, right up there with the 300 SL Gullwing. It sounds great. You're busy doing a lot of stuff all the time because frankly, there's just not that much power and nothing in the way of assists, but that's kind of the way you want it. Hey, there's a goat. Hey, goat. Now look. Porsche was kind enough to put me out in all their new stuff, the 911 Turbo Convertible, the 718 Boxster. Those are incredible sports cars and make no bones about it, you can feel the connection between something like this from the mid 50s and right on up to today. But I gotta say, those cars do everything so well and at such a high level that you don't feel as involved in the process as something like this. And why do we drive sports cars? We drive sports cars because they make us feel alive, because we're doing stuff. And when cars are too powerful and they have too many safety nannies and all of that, you don't really get to feel like you're on the edge of anything, unless you're doing really crazy velocities. And here, you really do. The steering's slow, there's a little bit of a dead spot, but not much. There's a four speed. And Honestly, with a sports car, you want to be involved. And here, I have to shift all the time because, frankly, I don't have very much power. I've got to be aware of weight transfer. I've got to be looking down the road, not just to see, you know, how much space I've got because I need more space for braking, but frankly, because I want to maintain momentum. I'm more active in the driving process, and that's wonderful. So this has a 1600cc engine mounted back there. Dual carbs, not a lot of power. 59 horsepower, but it's got 81 pound-feet of torque, or at least it did when it was new, and so that means you got plenty when you're in gear. Second and third in particular are really nice gears, very flexible. Now remember, this thing only weighs about 1,700 pounds, so that's actually a pretty decent amount of power for a car of this era. The truth is you're gonna get blown off the stoplight by just about every modern car today. Zero to 60, if I had to ballpark me somewhere in the eight and a half to nine second range, but everything feels much quicker. Everything feels more alive. Listen to those backfires. Now you feel so much more exposed in a car like this than a modern car. First of all, you've got this Speedster windshield, which is really low and you got these beautiful thin chrome pillars. Not gonna do a whole lot for you in an accident, but for visibility and for feeling like you're part of what's going on around outside you, this is ace. The sill is lower, got a great barrel to the door. If you're sitting over there on the passenger side, you might need to brace yourself because you ain't, don't have any seat belts and these seats kind of feel more like stadium cushions. There's not a lot of support and they're really small. There are a ton of little idiosyncrasies if you're not used to driving an old car. There's no radio in this thing. The, the wipers, they're really not worth a damn as we discovered here in Hawaii. We had some unseasonable rain. Uh, and the HVAC system, well, it's limited to this knob that's down below the gear shift lever and a couple of little slider vents that uh, sit down below your knee. That's it. But it's endearing. The other funny thing about this car is when you floor it, 
and you get near the red line, the pedal vibrates under your foot, the accelerator, as if to say, I'm not really kosher with this anymore, you better switch up. I love everything here. I love the, the thin steering wheel, the wood wheel from Nardi. I love the tight face on the gauges. This is just a beautiful automobile. I've got wide feet, but this has pretty narrow pedal spacing, but it's not like a Cobra where your pedals are skewed off to the right and the pedal box itself is super narrow, so it's totally manageable. Love it. The throws are pretty long and there's no center spring returning you to, to center on the gear shift, but it's very intuitive and the clutch is super forgiving. You got this tiny little Bakelite knob and this long wand of a shifter, but totally foreign to anything that uh, you'll find today, but it just works beautifully. Now the funny thing is, this is the oldest Porsche of the bunch. It's also turned out to be the most valuable because values on these have just gone through the roof. This car is probably about $350,000, $400,000, which is insane. Um, but the good news is there are some pretty decent uh, replicas out there and normally I'm not a replica guy, but the stuff that Beck and Intermechanica have been doing I hear is pretty good. So maybe you don't need to spend $300,000, $350,000 for something low mile like this. This, by the way, 24,000 clicks on the clock and those are kilometers. That's 14, 15,000 miles. There have been other discoveries here. First off, that 914.6 that I was so excited to drive, well, it didn't really do it for me the way that I thought it was. Especially the uh, the shifter really just felt pretty ropey and imprecise and I didn't really bond with that vehicle the way that I thought I would. One vehicle that I didn't expect to but absolutely love is the original Boxster. Now, I drove those cars back in the day but I forgot how good they are. I wasn't even driving the more powerful S, just a bog standard 986 and boy is it a solid vehicle still handles sweetly, still looks great. Yeah, the interior is a little plasticky and gloopily styled and all that sort of thing, but it drives wonderfully. It's got a nice shifter and good power and it's surprisingly refined. I really, really enjoyed that vehicle. Those are readily available for, you know, 10, 15 grand, maybe even a little bit less. I might have to go look into one of those because I sure as heck can't afford this guy. I have to be honest with you, even compared to that 911 Turbo that does everything, the new 2021 model or the 718 Boxer T, which does a lot of stuff right, or even some sweethearts from my childhood like the 944 Turbo Convertible, this is the car that I would take home every single day. Am I going to want to commute in it? Well, no, but I would. Now listen, the chance to drive all these amazing Porsches, these roadsters, these pure sports cars, comes amidst the backdrop that Porsche is reportedly working on a three-row crossover type thing. Now look, I'm not gonna fiend outrage anymore. Might have done that with the Cayenne, might have done that with the Panamera, but we're well past that. The thing you need to know is, Porsche always keeps the driving experience paramount in whatever segment it plays in. Whether you're driving a crossover SUV or a big fat sedan like the Panamera or a new EV like the Taycan, they are some of the best handling, most enjoyable cars in every segment they play in. That singularity of focus is rare in this business, even if you have to go and diversify enough to make sure that you're making money. But I gotta say, I really, really wish before the death of the internal combustion engine, Porsche would come out with something really stripped down and basic. Something like a modern update to this 356. Okay, collector car world, I, I get it, finally. I was watching the prices on these skyrocket on our site and I didn't understand why. And I've seen for years all the different replicas that are out there and I love the shape of this car, the simplicity of the form and everything, but I never really got all the hype, but this is one of those cases where you can meet your heroes and drive them 
and they live up to the billing. Oh yes. 5,500 RPM red line coming up. And the shift to fourth. Woo! Nothing else feels like this. Vintage cars are just special. And I love technology. I love electrification. I love ADAS features. I love modern stuff, but this man, it's just special in a different way. As much as I hate to do so, I gotta go give this back. It's raining outside. I've got convertible hair and a smile that I cannot get rid of. This has been an unbelievable two days. I've been privileged enough to drive the modern sports cars from Porsche alongside their historical antecedents. And it has been an incredible opportunity to feel how Porsche's bloodline runs right on through to the present day. But the high performance model that I want is actually the lowest performance model. It's this Speedster. It's incredible. It's visceral, it's beautiful, and it's the one I want to take home. Howard, you were a lucky, lucky bastard.